veliko mie za dovolstvo, što sum danas ovde sa vama. Koje dal sum ponovo u Srbiji. Želeo bi da se zahvalim srpskim sa vani čini sima. Koje Beograd skome Universitetu na ni hovoj no drustsi i motivacije da stvore nove obrazovne i nisti nisti jatavi kao na podstit sanju bilateralne trgovine i podizanju svesti o velikoj Britaniji kao svetskom centru teši tezi šta kapitala izvoru industrijski strateški partnerstva i preduzetništva u cilju restruktu i anea i modernizacija srpske privrede the father Wow. <laughs> so it's Mr. Director, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I will now speak in English. I've been asked today to talk about the global economy and education, to talk about the importance of education, the factors affecting education, and especially about the future of education in relation to the students of the University of Belgrade. I think this is a lovely quote from Nelson Mandela. Education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Education is the base of everything. If you are not educated, not well educated, the world is much more challenging and you can make much less contribution to it than the person who is properly educated. And when we look at education, there are many trends that influence it. And I'm going to discuss some of these and then finish by talking about the future for individuals. Technology clearly is changing very quickly. There are more scientists alive now than there have been in all of human history. Globalization is in some ways bringing us closer economically, but there are also many cultural issues. Population is shifting around the world, opening up new opportunities. Employment structures are changing the way in which organizations actually work and therefore the skills required from an education are also changing and changing quite quickly. So if we start with technology and very briefly but there are really two elements of technology which are affecting us. The real by which I mean the movement of physical things and the virtual by which we mean the movement of information. And both of those have been transformed uh, in the last 50 years. As this says, the future is approaching fast. The, it illustrates aircraft. I came here yesterday on Wizz Air. It took me two and a half hours from London. When I first came to Belgrade many years ago, it took me about four days because we drove, I was a student, we drove a minibus from London to Belgrade, slept in a tent and all of that, and went on to Istanbul and Athens and then back up the then Yugoslavian coast to Venice, uh, Milan and back to London. So it has changed. That was a huge adventure to come to Belgrade three or four decades ago. Now it's just a matter of the most adventurous part now is getting to Luton Airport in London. 
The other physical thing has changed, as well as people being able to move, is goods. It's been a, often not talked about, but a huge transformation in the movement of goods, mainly because of container ships. Moving a container is now very cheap. A big container, a 10 meter container, if you want to send it to China or somewhere like that, it's about $3,000 typically. On a good day, only $2,000. You get a lot in a container, and that means that exports, imports, trade can expand so much more than they could before. So we have, firstly, the movement, much easier movement of people, the much easier movement of goods. But then we come to the movement of information. The World Wide Web, invented, of course, by the great Englishman Sir Tim Berners-Lee. And that, of course, has transformed the movement of information. We now uh, all go to our computers, to Google, to find out things. We were, I was talking to your senior staff this morning about libraries. Many university libraries now have few books in them. They have many computers because so much of the information is online. But it's not always truthful. Um, this is two people discussing their love lives over the internet and you can never be quite sure what it is is at the other end. So one has to be careful with information on the internet. It's not always perfect, but it does support good institutions. And this is a famous advertisement for Gillette, the best a cat can get. It's meant to be obviously for shaving for men, but it's, uh, it does show the power of branding across the internet. And so you have to be very careful about what can you trust and what can you not trust. So this is just to start by saying technology is changing things so quickly. And technology doesn't have to uh, require huge resources to use. There's a story about Professor Rutherford at Cambridge uh, in the 1930s. He split the atom, one of the biggest experiments, most important experiments of the 20th century. And he was visited by some American scientists. And he was working in the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge, where I also, on a much more modest scale, studied uh, when I was there. And the scientists looked at the Cavendish Laboratory and it was a pretty crummy building. And his equipment was pretty poor. It was held together with, literally with string and things like that. And they said to him, well, Professor Rutherford, how can you operate? How can you do these great experiments in these conditions? And he said, well, there are problems and we don't have much money. So what we have to do is think. And that, I think, is a very good uh, story, especially in a university. But it's not around the world. And this quote from Kofi Annan, the gap between information haves and have-nots is widening. There's a real danger that the world's poor will be excluded from the emerging knowledge-based global economy. And thinking of education internationally, just taking Africa as an example, and I do a fair amount of work uh, in that continent. Africa has about a billion people. By 2050, it'll have two billion people. There are about 250 million school pupils. 95% of those graduate without having touched a computer. Complete contrast. And the cost of the infrastructure, hardware, and curricular development is prohibitive for most of those governments. Now, as you may have picked up, I was involved in a charity called Digital Links International, and we took refurbished computers from the UK to African countries, and this is an example in a school in Benin in West Africa. It transforms the school, something very simple like that. So when one looks at education internationally, one really has to understand the different levels which it's at. And some very nice quotes, a student in Nairobi in Kenya 
the introduction of computers in our school was the best thing that happened to me. I now know many things that I did not know. And from South Africa, how glad am I to know that there is so much to learn from this little box. It has changed my life and brought the whole world to me. So one can see education and technology at very different levels around the globe. So I'd now like to talk about globalization and the trends of that, because they will undoubtedly affect all of the students in this room. So what is globalization? Basically, it's greater interconnectivity, as we've seen of people and of goods. And it's very much like the third law of physics of Isaac Newton, who happens also to be a Cambridge, or was a Cambridge person, and you may have seen him featured in the opening ceremony of the Paralympic Games recently. And his law of physics says when there's an action, there's a reaction. And it's the same with globalization. The action is the increasing significance and volume of economic flows across countries and cultures. More trade, more activity. The reaction is the increasing impact of global forces on local life and culture. So the local communities often changed, sometimes changed quite radically, and sometimes changed very unpopularly uh, by globalization. It started a long time ago. About three and a half million years ago, we started to walk. About 1.6 million years ago, we stood up to walk, which was much more efficient. About 900,000 years ago, we got to China. We invented fire, and so we could move north out of Africa. It's about 7,000 miles from Kenya to Beijing. It took us 700,000 years. So uh, we didn't go very quickly. We went about um, a hundredth of a mile uh, every year, so about 50 yards a year. But we eventually, uh, eventually got there. Sorry, 50 feet a year, but we eventually got there. The last part that was colonized was South America, where people came across from Asia to Alaska and down through America. And then 3,000 years ago, we really got going with the development of agriculture. And that was really the first technological major breakthrough. And you can see the effect it had on this graph of world population. Before 4000 BC, there were only about 10 million people in the whole world. But with agriculture, it gradually went to 50 million. And by the year zero, it was about 200 million. A huge change, 20 fold increase in population because of the invention of agriculture. But then Europe had a bad patch. Europe had been doing well with the Greeks and the Romans, but that all fell apart um, and we had the Dark Ages. But in other parts of the world, things were prospering. In Mexico, in Java, in Indonesia, Cambodia, Persia, and indeed especially in China. So it's not a surprise that back then, between the years naught and a thousand, Asia represented about three quarters of the GNP of the world. It was all happening in Asia. You can see the other lines. The blue line is Latin America and Africa. They had quite a good millennium. Things were moving up a little bit. Europe was pretty static. And North America and Australia essentially zero uh, because of course uh, they did have native tribes there but a very low level of economic activity. I, I skipped through history very quickly but that began to change with European exploration. Christopher Columbus who went to the West Indies, Vasco da Gama went to India, Magellan went all the way around and Francis Drake opened up trade to North and South America. And that had quite an effect. Uh, 
Firstly, helping the population to grow. You can see it got stuck at about 200 for most of that millennium. But then it did begin to grow as people settled down and then it accelerated after about 1400 and got to 800 million by the 1700s. But 60% of the people were in Asia, 20% in Europe and 15% in Latin America and Africa. So it's not surprising that Asia still was a big chunk of the world's GNP, but you can see that Europe started to move up because of the riches, the wealth that came from the exploration and moved up to just over 30 percent. The Latin America and Africa drifted downwards and North America Australia were just beginning to have an effect. In 1776 Adam Smith wrote his book, really the first economics textbook, called The Wealth of Nations, still probably the most famous book of its kind. And he recorded in there, China is a much richer country than any part of Europe. But he also had probably what is the most famous sentences in economics, which then powered the uh, western uh, side of the, hemis of, the of the globe. And he talked about the invisible hand. How does an economy work? And he said, and the English may not be all that easy, but he said it is not from the benevolence, not from the goodness of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love. And that sentence is really the uh, theoretical background to all of free enterprise. In free enterprise, people do things because they serve their customers, but they also make money for themselves. And it was that philosophy which began to take hold very much in the UK first, and then in other parts of Europe. And then came technological change in the West. The steam engine, uh, James Watt, obviously better ships, medical advances, all through the uh, 19th century, the 1800s, uh, films, sewing machines, transport improvements. And they were very much concentrated in Europe and North America. So, with those improvements, especially the medical ones, the population has kept rising. It's gone from 800 million, it was 6 billion in the year 2000, it's now about 7 billion uh, in 2012. But 60% of the people were still in Asia. Uh, Europe had gone down to 13% by 2000, uh, and Latin America and Africa, 20%. And because of all those scientific advances concentrated in the West, Asia had a very bad uh, 150 years. And the proportion of the world's GDP in Asia dropped from 60% to 20%. And that's the world in which we've sort of grown up in. Uh, that's how it's been. The West has been the rich ones and Asia the poor ones and sadly Latin America and Africa not uh, developing very much at all. But then from 1950 onwards Asia began to come back. Firstly Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, Philippines etc. And then of course more recently China and to some extent India. So they're now back to about 40 percent of the total Europe, as you will see, has dropped, and North America has stayed stable, as has Latin America and Africa. But of course there are still huge contrasts between the rich and the poor, both within countries, but even more importantly, between countries. There's a rich billion living in North America, Europe, 
Japan and Australasia and there's a poor 6 billion living in the rest of the world. So if we look forward what is going to be the next 50 years? And these are some estimates of population, GDP per capita and therefore the total GDP for the four regions. These, the population estimates are the UN ones and you'll see that the population of Europe is expected to be constant or possibly slightly decline. America, Australasia increase a little. Latin and America and Africa having by far the biggest increase and Asia having something of an increase. So if we uh, project those figures we move the world population from the 6 billion in the year 2000 to 9 billion in the year 2050. But interestingly Asia is still 60% of the world's population but you can see that Latin America and Africa have come up to nearly 30% and Europe is down now to 8%. So when one looks at one's future careers it, there are a lot of signs there about where the action might be. And talking to the students, uh, one of the fascinating things, because of course it's not uniform, is the change in the student age population, normally defined as the 20 to 29 year olds in different countries. And in China, that grouping is expected to drop by 34% in number. In Japan, by 23%, etc., etc. But to increase in India and several other countries. But if one translates those percentages into numbers, China will lose 76 million people out of the student age group. A huge reduction. Japan and the others losing some. And on the other side, India will gain 28 million students. So if you're investing in education, you can see where the growth market is and where the difficult market is likely to be. So if we then look at GDP, having taken those assumptions of population and rough assumptions of GDP per capita, assuming Europe and the ex-USSR uh, can achieve 1.5% per capita, and Asia, though, achieving 5%. Um, now over 50 years, those of mathematical minded, if you do 1.05 to the 50th power, it multiplies by about 12 times. It accumulates to 12 times. So if one then looks at the graph and applies those figures, you will see that by 2050, Asia will be back to being three quarters of the world's G GDP. And each of Europe, North America, Australia, and Latin America, Africa, will only be about 10%. So it is really a, sub a huge change in world economics that we are now looking at. If we look at whether we can even achieve that in Europe, if we look at Europe versus Asia, Adam Smith, he didn't think much of governments, Adam Smith, uh, but he did recognize they had to do some things, they had some useful functions. And he said there were three useful functions of a government, security, justice, and infrastructure. Now if we look at security and Europe, we have pretty weak armies and they don't have much popular support. We see this in the various conflicts that have been in the last 10 years. Justice is often good, but it tends to be slow and expensive. And infrastructure we just don't seem very good at that. We're certainly not very good at it in the UK, I'm afraid. Although we build excellent things, it takes us a very long time to do it. We have NIMBYs, who are not in my backyard people. So people who don't want the motorway or the railway or whatever to come past them. And we tend to give priority to short-term social expenditure. And that is true across most of Europe compared with most of Asia. We pay people more not to work certainly in Western Europe, than China pays people to work. Now that cannot be a very good long-term strategy to uh, pay people not to work. We're trying to require a 35-hour week 
while Chinese businessmen are trying to work out how to achieve a 35-hour day. It probably needs to get worse before it gets better because most people in Europe are not conscious of these huge changes which are coming upon them, about the massive competition from the 6 billion. So there has to be a question, can even the 1.5% GDP per capita growth be achieved? It clearly hasn't been achieved across Europe uh, uh, consistently in any way over the last 10 years. So that is the economic side of globalization. But there's also the issue of culture. And culture is very important. Because you can't just buy and sell things regardless. You can't go and run organizations regardless. I had a group of senior Chinese businessmen from one of the Paris Statal Investment Corporations came uh, to see me just this last Monday. And I did a, a presentation to them. And their concern was that they've spent billions of pounds buying all sorts of things around the, uh, around the world, but they do find it very hard to get them to work well. And they find the culture, the management styles, and those things. They wanted my sort of thoughts on that. And culture is very important when you want to get things done. So what is culture? Well, culture is the way we do things when nobody help tells us how to do them. You know, what clothes do we put on in the morning? What, how do we walk down the street? All that sort of stuff is part of culture. And culture is like water to a fish. A fish doesn't know that water exists until the fish jumps out of the water. And most people go about their daily life in their hometown, not thinking about the particular culture there. But if they go to another country or another continent, they quickly realize that there are different ways of doing things. And we have to recognize that we, there are three characteristics we all have. We're all like all others. We're all the same. Everybody in this room is the same because they have basic human needs. However, we're all different at the same time. We're all completely different because each person is unique in his or her own rights and the way in which we operate, whether it's appearance or intelligence or education or whatever it might be. But we're like some others and not like others. And that is the culture. We share it with some, but not with others. Serbian people share a culture, largely. British people share a culture, largely. But there are differences between those two countries, although lots of similarities, but much greater differences across uh, continents. And this has to be recognized. And where, how does it affect people? Well, it affects, at the top, the national and ethnic issues. Norms, preferences, avoidances. The whole nation has similarities. Each nation has similarities. But then, if you go to work in an organization, organizations have different cultures. Some are very fast moving, some are slow moving, some are deliberative, lots of committees, some are autocratic, etc. And then within an organization, you may find differences in the functions. The way the marketing people work may be different from the financial people or the factory people. And even within a team, if you're a team within a function, there may be some people who approach the task differently. And then, of course, there's the individual with their own personality, values, upbringing, and motivations. So how does one, what does one have to be sensitive about in culture? Well, firstly, values and norms. What is the normal way of doing things in the particular country you're in? That may be shown by dress and appearance, by communication and language, by religion, time and grace periods. Some cultures are very precise. If the meeting's at uh, nine o'clock, the meeting's at nine o'clock. Some countries, if the meeting's at nine o'clock, you've got a sporting chance that it might start at quarter to 10. So you have very different approaches to time. The issue of teamwork. Do you do it through teams and, or do you do it from the top? And I'll come back to that one. The management hierarchy. How much freedom is there or is it a matter of direction? 
and common cultural mistakes. Believing your way is the universal way. Obviously everybody should do it the way I do it, is a, an unfortunate attitude. You may think that everybody who's really good is just like you. Maybe they support the same football team, or maybe they have the same color hair, or maybe they went to the same school. So you think they must be better people than other people. If you go overseas and you do what you've always done at home, that's often a cultural mistake, whether it's eating a meal or talking to somebody. You may fail to emphasize with another solution. That means somebody suggests something, you say, oh no, that's rubbish, without really understanding the culture in which that came from. You may not invest in relationships. You actually need to get to know the culture, get to know the people. You may not do the research about what is what is polite and what is rude in a particular country. You may be superior, look down on these other people, give them advice which they didn't really ask for. Or you may indeed get upset because somebody says something to you and you think that's really very nasty of them to say that, but in fact it may be perfectly reasonable. And the British sense of humour uh, has been known to upset people from other countries because we tend to sort of dig at people sometimes. And uh, some, some uh, cultures uh, understand that and some don't, including our cousins from America sometimes, I have to say. Dress. You can be overdressed and then they tend to think you're trying to be more important than they are. Or you can be underdressed, so they think you're not to be taken seriously. There may be rules about dress, safety rules or practical rules, and if you don't go along with those, then you're perceived as not knowing the environment. An example is business casual. In Japan, business casual means you take off your waistcoat and only wear a two-piece suit. In California, it means you wear a shirt and sandals. Smiles. North America, everybody smiles at everybody. They're friendly to strangers in the street, etc., etc. Germany and Switzerland, they tend to only smile when there's something to smile about. In France, they think you're a bit deranged if you smile at them, usually. And in the Far East, they don't smile, except when, usually when they're embarrassed or there's some, something very uh, edgy about the situation. So those are just some examples of how the world needs to be understood. It's not all about the economics. And so moving on to what most people will be doing, most of the students in this room, they will go and work in an organization. Uh, typically, in the West, uh, 15 to 20 percent of the people work for the government, and the other 80 to 85 percent work for some form of free enterprise or charity, non-governmental organization. But pretty much everybody who goes to work uh, goes and works in an organization. There are a few individuals, a one-man window cleaning business or something like that, but uh, hopefully that will not be the entire future of people here. So there was a traditional hierarchy. This is how it used to be. You can see the management and the employees in the picture on the right. Organization charts, lines of authority. A boss, the old man at the top. Authority was generally enough to get people to do things, like the army. You tell them to do it and they do it. And your success basically depended on keeping the boss happy. You, know, you did what you're told, you kept your head down, and you're likely to be promoted. That's changing. Global organizations now have changed. Up until maybe the Second World War, they were sort of colonial, the way that most businesses organized. You had a headquarters function, and you had the money in the home country, and you doled it out around the world. Expatriate managers were sent to run regions like colonies. I was sent to run Cadbury Shrips Kenya, and that was in the 1980s. And there was a pretty strict hierarchy between the head office and the regions. That began to change, and you began to move home country operations into the regional markets. So certainly in Cadbury Shrips that had begun to happen. Uh, with Kenya, you had the skills there, uh, and developed the skills there. The headquarter was the communication hub, the regions were the satellites, and there was a simple organizational matrix. Now, though, it's become transnational. It's become very confused. If you talk to one of the big accounting firms, 
or one of the big manufacturing companies or telecommunications companies, you'll find that really they do the job where the job is best done, where the talent is to be found. The workforce is organized around hubs of expertise. They may choose a particular place for some part of their organization and another place for something else. And it's a complex matrix because often the teams are in different countries. So the management environment, the environment that most of you here are going to work in, there is increasing market convergence. As we've seen the globalization, things are coming together. But local entities are still very important. That's how you make it, make it happen. So you need to recognize those local differences, the culture, and the technological acceleration, because things are moving very quickly. You've got to understand that the organization will get more and more complex. And most importantly, you'll have to lead diverse teams. So that's the sort of environment which people now graduating are going to go into. Those are the sort of skills required. That's the challenges to be faced. And I was involved with the Chartered Management Institute in the UK. I was president a few years ago. And we did a report called Achieving Management Excellence. And we interviewed a wide range of public and private organizations. And these were the eight top things that they were looking for in their management teams and their management. The most important thing is managing people. Then leadership, team working, customer focus, managing operations, verbal communications, time management, coaching and counseling, and only number eight equal was functional and technical skills. So although it's important to know the theory, lots of people know the theory, the things that sets people out in a modern organization is those other eight elements, the human elements. So it's down, it's all about teamwork now. That's what it's all about. You have to be able to operate in a team. And all the good business schools now spend a lot of time with their students working in teams so that they uh, can get to know how to operate in a team. Because although you can have distance learning to some extent, in the end, in the workplace, it's down about people and about persuading other people to do what you want and listening to other people to see if they've got a contribution to make. And as the teams become more global, they're more difficult to communicate with. They're becoming more common with increasingly borderless businesses. You may have members of your team in all sorts of different places. And it's difficult operating that because they're usually in complex matrix organizations. You may need a finance person, a marketing person, an operations person, an advertising person, whatever in your team. And they may be in different countries, whatever. So you've got multiple time zones and cultures. And if the management of that is not good, it falls apart much faster than did the old hierarchies. And Blaine Rushak, National Director of US Campus Recruiting for KPMG, one of the big four auditing firms, uh, said globalization continues to transform the business landscape. This has led to an increased hiring emphasis on college graduates that possess or have the ability to acquire global skills and competencies. Having professionals with international experience gives us a competitive advantage because clients are increasingly, lo increasingly are looking for advisors who can offer global perspectives. And Rosabeth Moss Cantor, a professor at Harvard Business School, said this new type of hero must learn to operate without the might of the hierarchy behind them. The crutch of authority must be thrown away and replaced by their own ability to make relationships, use influence, and work with others to achieve results. So the world you're entering is a much more fluid world. The extreme of that, perhaps, is entrepreneurship. As they say, if you've got to work for some idiot, you might as well work for yourself. And free enterprise, as we've seen. We've emerged, obviously, from testing times recently. Some countries have emerged more than others. But in all countries, it is business which will provide the basis for the upturn. It's free enterprise which generates the wealth 
which pays for the schools, the hospitals, social services and indeed to some extent the universities. Darwin was right, the fittest survived. Darwin of course being another great Cambridge alumnus. What are entrepreneurs? Well they think the unthinkable, Some we all do that, but they actually then go out and do it. And that is the key thing, the actual doing it. Now who would invest in this group? Here's a group of entrepreneurs. Anybody like to give me a thousand dollars or dinars to invest in this lot? Does anybody know who they are? Well, this is the Microsoft team photograph of 1978 with a young chap called Gates in the bottom left hand corner. So had you given me your thousand dollars back in 1978 you certainly wouldn't be sitting here today. You'd be out on your yacht or something. So that is one of the most successful groups of entrepreneurs of the last uh, 30 years. So what is an entrepreneur? What's the difference between a manager and an entrepreneur? Well managers actually are replaceable. If you fall under a bus they'll find another one. They administer, they keep things going, they maintain things, they focus on structures, they rely on controlling. They usually take a fairly short-term view to achieve whatever it is this month or this quarter. They ask how and when. They keep their eye on the bottom line, on the costs and the income. They accept the status quo because they're part of the structure. A classic good soldier, thinking but basically doing what they're told. And they do things right. Now an entrepreneur is almost completely different. They're original. Very hard to replace an entrepreneur because the entrepreneur embodies the business. They innovate, they develop, and they focus on the people. They inspire trust. They usually have a long-range perspective. People like uh, Henry Ford with cars, or Thomas Watson at IBM, struggled for years and decades to really get to where it was they thought they could get to. An entrepreneur asks what and why. Their eye is on the horizon, on where they're trying to get to not what's happening next month. They challenge the status quo. The whole purpose of an entrepreneur is to do something differently. They're their own person. They're not in a structure, they're it. And they do the right thing, or they like to think they are. They have sort of moral values about what is good about whatever it is they are doing. And so you come to the issues of risk and enterprise. And sadly, not everybody becomes an entrepreneur for one very good reason which is success cannot be easily predicted. Many people try, but actually few are very successful. There aren't many Bill Gates uh, or Steve Jobs in the world. Because like exploration, at the beginning we cannot gauge success. If you go to climb Mount Everest or to cross the Atlantic in a rowing boat, it's not obvious. You may make it, hopefully you will, but it, you cannot be certain of success when you start out. And that applies to all new ideas and projects, not just in business, but in charities and in public sector organizations as well. But we have to have risk, because if we didn't have risk, if we didn't have people trying new things, there would be no progress. So risk is an absolutely vital part of the human psyche. And it's the risk, taking a risk, trying something new, that actually moves the whole society ahead. The worst thing is complacency. And Picasso, the famous artist, said success is dangerous. One begins to copy oneself. It's more dangerous than to copy others. It leads to sterility. And that can happen to individuals, but most frequently it happens to organizations who think they're brilliant. When everything is going well, something has been overlooked. And you know, you mustn't ever think you're doing as best you can. The famous British architect Norman Foster, he said, creativity and arts cannot prosper without uncertainty. Artists in particular are always trying something new. Yehudi Menuhin, the violinist, there is a lack of mediation and creativity everywhere, especially in schools. The arts are missing from our lives and we're giving way to violence. So in education there has to be the fourth R. In Britain we talk about the three R's, reading, writing and arithmetic. 
but the fourth R is arts. And arts creativity is an increasingly important part of the curriculum, the agenda for universities and, other, and schools around the world. Because it's the creative thing that will get the society ahead. If you just do the same as everybody else is doing, you'll get paid about as much as everybody else is paid. Because the creative spirit, it shapes the human personality. It brings out people's full potential. It opens up a new horizon for every person. If you get used to experimenting and thinking, it doesn't matter whether you're any good at painting or music or whatever, you can do it on your computer, you can do it daydreaming as you walk along the street. But think of new things. It helps people to maintain their emotional balance. And it fosters harmonious behavior if people are being creative together. And the worst part of not, that, of not being that is the risk of no risk. And Theodore Roosevelt, the US president, said, the only man who never makes a mistake is the man who never does anything. And Mark Twain, on the positive side, said, 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the ones that you did do. So throw off the bowlines, that's the ropes, sail away from the safe harbor. Catch the trade winds in your sails. Explore, dream, discover. So despite or because of the fast-changing world, opportunities abound out there. And I uh, wish you all the best luck. So let's just finish at the individual level, especially for the younger members of the audience. And to paraphrase John Kennedy in his inauguration speech, not only think what, you can, what can Serbia do for you, but what can you do for Serbia? Because you'll come to your graduation day, those who are not yet there, it'll be a day of contrasts. You'll be happy to, probably happy to be leaving your course behind because you'll have passed, but probably sad to be leaving your friends. You'll be moving to a new stage in your life, a day of anticipation, therefore, but also of apprehension, of worry, of concern about what that might bring. So what has happened while you've been at university? Well, hopefully, it's altered the way you look at the world. You've undergone a transformation of some sort within yourselves. Hopefully, you've fulfilled your potential. You've used all of the materials and opportunities you've been given. And hopefully within yourself you've found something you really like, something special to offer the world. But also discovered how much we all depend on each other. And coming back to the theme about the teams. So your degrees are a reward, but they're also a challenge. What are you going to do with your talents? What do you want to achieve? What do you want to change? How are you going to shape the world? Who are you going to help? And those five questions are ones I ask you to keep in your mind as you move from university outwards. And for those who've already done that, probably also to keep them in mind. The way ahead is graduation brings uncertainty. And like a university, where it's pretty clear what you have to do, even if it's difficult to do it, life has no core curriculum. There's nobody out there saying you've got to do this, this, and this, and this. You, the entire place is an elective. It's up to you to choose. The paths are infinite and the results uncertain. College, university is something you complete. Life is something you experience. And most importantly, life is not a dress rehearsal. It's not a preparation for something. We only get one chance, so make the most of it. Just uh, whenever you can, remember that phrase. And Robert Heller, the management writer, has described how some people are quite happy going to the beach and paddling in the water and just enjoying things. He contrasts those sort of people with a heroic navigator who goes off to some far-flung land. Now that navigator uh, may not make it, may drown en route. But if he does get, or she, get to the promised land, 
then in fact they may get riches or benefits which the people who never leave the shore cannot get. And if they prepare themselves well and they're lucky, then they have a sporting chance of getting to the promised land. So you are the future managers, professionals, creative artists and entrepreneurs. You will become role models for others, probably your children, but probably within your organizations as well. And that needs to be based on the highest principles. Because in this increasingly global world, whether working for a country or a company, competition is in the end between workforces, how they're organized, how well educated they are. And people do not want to be managed. They actually want to be led. And leadership is the key thing which university graduates should provide. Leadership causes organizations to overcome their own inertia. If there's not leadership, they'll just bumble along. It has to respond to changing conditions. Because if the organization just keeps doing the same thing as the technology and everything else changes out there, then it has problems. The leader gives an organization its vision. And then it translates that vision into reality. You have to reconcile the wood and the trees. That means the big picture with the detail. You have to have a big picture where you're going, but you also have to deal with the detail. And the leader should give the heartbeat to the organization. Actually, as with the body, it's the heart which provides the energy for everything to happen. So, good luck. But remember, your career is not everything. If you imagine life as a game in which you're juggling five balls, work, family, friends, health and spirit. And you, in this game you have to keep all of these balls in the air. You'll find, especially if you've got a good degree, that work is a sort of rubber ball. If you drop it, it will usually bounce back. It may look a little different, but it'll usually bounce back. But the other four balls, family, friends, health and spirit, if you drop one of those, it's easily damaged or shattered. And therefore, try to strive for balance in your life. Believe in yourselves. There'll be times when each of you will have problems. Difficult to keep all of those balls in the air. But have the courage of your convictions. Have the courage to be yourself. Remember, you all have something special to offer, and you can become a leader in your chosen field. So as I say, good luck. What matters most is how you see yourself. Are you the domestic cat, or are you the lion or lioness? But if it does go wrong, don't worry, it does happen to all the best people. This is Mr. Gates on a not very good day for him. And if all else fails, remember the words of Paul Getty, the famous oil magnet. He was asked what he would recommend to young people to get on in life like he had. He said, well, there are three things. Firstly, get up early. Secondly, work hard. And thirdly, find oil. <laughs> so, good luck to all of you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.